At the time, they said to me, you've never worked a hard day in your life. What do you want to do? They said to me, Josh, the only way we'll trust you with our brand in a country, in another country, is if you work for us for a year on the grill. And I was like, whoa. GYG came to Singapore 10 years ago and has already 17 outlets across the island. Never before has a Mexican fast food chain achieved such success here. Today, we talk to F&B entrepreneur Josh, the man who brought the GYG franchise to Singapore. So I know you're an Aussie. What's an Aussie doing with Mexican food? I know, man. I've got a funny story on that, actually. So the first store we opened in Asia Square in 2014, a Singaporean uncle came up to the front counter and I was on the till. I was serving customers. And he walks up to the front counter and he says, <clears throat> what are you doing here? And I said, oh, this is my restaurant. You know, this is my restaurant. And he goes, you sound Australian. And I said, yeah, I'm Australian. He goes, this is Mexican, right? And I said, yeah. And he goes, so you're an Australian selling Mexican food in Asia? I was like, yeah, I actually, that's actually true. <laughs> and then he says, and he goes, but have you been to Mexico? I was like, no, I haven't. I haven't been to Mexico. <laughs> So, um, man, it's a long story on how we how we wound up selecting Singapore for the first international market. But we knew that Southeast Asia was ready for Mexican cuisine. Mm. I've got a fantastic partner here named Kokong Lim. Um, we've, over the years, built a very strong friendship and partnership. Um, that partnership was the incubator of why we chose Singapore. Um, and, uh, yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> for those that don't know, franchising business how does that work and you know yeah. if you could just help us understand how you got into this business and how you brought create Mexican food into our okay. island man funny story so I was in Sydney working in another industry um, I'd gone to university for five six years and then was working in another industry for about six years um, and then I was actually introduced to the founders of GYG these two Americans um, who are who have now become like family to me but at the time, they said to me, American accent, they said to me, Josh, you've never worked a hard day in your life. They call me a wasp, like they call me this, this slang word. Yeah. And uh, they, said, they said to me, what do you want to do? And I said, you know, I'd like to do international markets. We were originally looking at London. And um, they said to me, Josh, the only way we'll trust you with our brand in a country, in another country, is if you work for us for a year on the grill for a year and I was like whoa whoa and uh, and that year was actually the the, um, the effectively like the PhD in restaurants for me and what they what they encouraged or fought, what they encouraged me to do turned out to be I think I think one of the founding elements of success in Singapore doing that those hard yards in, in Australia and Sydney working on the grill, working on the sales, mm. understanding the technology, understanding the food, the recipes in, in detail. Um, there's no way to shortcut that. So um, that's how it all began. And then um, once I established a relationship with the Singapore partner, my Singapore partner now, Kok and Lim, we got on so well so quickly and a um, bit of a miracle that we were, that we were so close so quickly. Um, and so we knew that together, once together in, in partnership, we would be able to accelerate the business quickly, you know. Um, and then so we chose to launch and um, yeah, it was a bit of a Hail Mary. What was the toughest thing during that one year of PhD oh. learning? You had no idea of F&B no, before going in, right? No idea. I was totally green, had no idea. What, where were you before that? I was at UBS, sort of Swiss bank in Sydney. Swiss bank, yeah, yeah. Good food, yeah. F&B, yeah. Mexican food, yeah. in Asia. Yeah, weird man, very weird. In hindsight, what was I thinking? <laughs> but, um, Man, that, to your question, the hardest thing, I think in that first year, um, I mean, everybody speaks about it, right? f and is tough and uh, it, it's physical and it's, it is long hours, but um, uh, I think that, that was the most confronting part for me, I think. Going from controlling your hours, you know, nine to five or nine to eight or whatever, um, to having unpredictable hours. I mean, something can go wrong at midnight in a mm. restaurant and you've got to, jump out of bed and go fix things. And so um, that was very confronting in that first year. And what was like the uh, thing that you look forward to in that one year of PhD? Do you think that all entrepreneurs need to kind of really have a handle of all their business aspects? Awesome, man. I think the 
uh, one of the founders, Stephen, who's a very um, close friend of mine now, he says, he says this thing which at first doesn't make a lot of sense. He says, pain is a privilege. Pain is a privilege. So if you don't find something that's very painful, it's probably not going to be valuable. Right? You, you have to search for where the pain is and that's where you know something magical can be created. It sounds a bit philosophical, but over the years, it's, it's meant more and more to me. Mm. And I think, man, if, I mean, the other thing about a business is once you press go, once you start, it never stops. You yeah. can't stop it. You can't pause it. Yeah. You can't have a holiday. Yeah. You can't really um, just switch it off for two weeks and <laughs> kind of a sick day because what happens, you know, the business shuts. So I think, I think all the entrepreneurs need to, I mean, in my view, need to be excited about the pain, you know, that, that comes and it's inevitable. Excited about the pain. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds a bit crazy. Yeah, crazy, man. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, was, I wish I could claim credit for that, but no, it's the founder. He, he, he makes a very good point, you know. Yeah. If you can endure that pain, um, that's where the magic is. Yeah. And how do you manage to convince someone to trust the brand with you and say that, look, yeah. take this brand with you into Asia? Man. Yeah. No, it's such a funny journey. So in the, in the first year, Stephen and Robert, they were really investing a lot into me and I don't think they trusted me. <laughs> in fact, I'm sure they didn't trust me. But I, th I, think, they, I think they thought that I was going to destroy the brand and <laughs> blow myself up here in Singapore. Yeah. But um, uh, man, I think, I think what um, proved my stripes or proved my worthiness was, was really that time, that year, year and a half working for them, you know? Not really making any money, mm. um, um, but the, the fully invested in the um, the long term plan for the business, and that that does start with a really long foundation. You know, b building a really solid base, and um, I think th that that also built a personal relationship between Steve and I, yeah. which meant that by the end, I think they may have slightly trusted me by the time we launched. So, for those that wants to for example bring a brand into singapore yeah how does it how do they start like where where do they go and you know what and also what would the numbers look like yeah i mean on, on average yeah. we have really um tapped into a lot of the advisory and um uh guidance from the singapore government from all the different divisions from mom to moh to edb to um esg enterprise all these, all these parts of the Singapore government are so, so powerful and um, so incredibly supportive and um, really help to avoid the landmines of setting up a new business, you know, and we really, we got a lot of value out of that. Thank you, Singapore, you know, we love, <laughs> we're patriots. <laughs> but um, that would be the first thing, I think, but in terms of numbers, the, I mean, the, the, the blessing of Singapore being an international sort of conduit to the rest of the region and international hub freight and logistics is very very affordable everything's here right everything's flowing through here from construction equipment to ingredients to you know electronics to point of sale iPad everything's here so um, that means that the cost and capex is a bit lower um, my fit outs in Australia in Singapore are about half of the cost of a fit out in Australia. Mm. Yet the restaurants here are a lot smaller, so they should be a lot less than the Australian restaurants. But um, yeah, I mean, we our, our first our first outlet we needed about six hundred thousand sing for all of the training, website, uniforms, obviously the fit outs where we're sitting in right now. Mm. Um, uh, we sent a lot of staff to Australia for training to build up their confidence in the brand, bring them back to Singapore. So. It was a lot of capital in hindsight, but but um, takes money to make money, as they say. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So, what's the GYG culture? First and foremost is um, all. It's all about the food, and we've never, we really have never forgotten that. I think as a business begins to scale, it's very tempting to perhaps engineer the cost of goods mm. to try and improve profitability or um, streamline ops. We we just have never compromised. This is again thanks to Stephen, our founder, um, and that's woven into the fabric of the business. You know, we're, we're passionate about the food and food safety, 
um, storage, our supply chain. Um, the, the, I mean, we would much prefer to waste a whole chiller of ingredients that yeah. we weren't confident were to the caliber that we require than try and sell it. You know, um, that's, I think that's the first point. It's all about the food for us, you know. And the second point I think that's really resonated a lot with Singapore especially, one of our core values is be real. Mm. So I think in Australia, um, we talk about this a lot actually, in Australia, this, this Singaporean friend of mine, a very smart guy, he said, you know why Australia has the culture of she'll be right, she'll be right, don't worry about it, she'll be right mate, you know that. He said because Australia has no neighbours, it's this big island, so we're, everyone's pretty chill, you know, there's no one sort of breathing down our neck. Um, whereas in Singapore, I mean, there's all these legions around 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 yeah. Singapore, multicultural, multilinguistic, multi background. There's just so much. Um, there's so much blend of different cultures. The, why am I saying that? The reason I'm saying that is it makes communication and culture more difficult to mm. to build because you've got to cross borders on language, you've got to cross borders on culture, yeah. that's hard, you know, yeah. that's tough, man. And so um, our core value of Be Real has unlocked that a lot. And so we, the, the team really know that each, each of them have each other's back. Yeah, there may be language barriers, there may be, there may be cultural barriers, but we know that, look, we're in it together, you know, we're a team. Um, and, and that's really galvanized us a lot, you know. And, and as we've scaled, we've managed to maintain that culture, um, which I'm very proud of. You know, I'm very proud of my team. We 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 call them the dream team. You know, and I believe they truly are. We have the dream team. Yeah. What's your leadership style, man? My leadership style. I think. Ah, oh, man. That's. I think his his the the instruction or the culture we have internally within GYG, and I like to think this is not just me, but our whole team at the top. Normal companies are like a pyramid, right? The, mm. the bosses sit at the top. They don't do enough. Can't offend the boss. Yeah, you can't offend the boss. They don't do enough work. They go play golf, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Then the middle management and then the, the, the frontline restaurant staff where the engine room is, right? Yeah. That's normal. I like to think for GYG, we're like this. So I, my partner and I, were at the bottom. We work for our middle management team and mm. our job is to make sure the middle management team have everything they need, they feel confident, they know that we've got their back, they tell us where we should be investing, they tell us where things are going wrong, they get angry at us when things aren't good enough, which I'm very proud of again, I'm very proud of that. But, but importantly, their job is to work for the restaurants. And the most important job in the whole company is our restaurant manager and our head chef. So what, what's one thing they've told you that you've adopted and you've and he was successful. So there's a guy in the team, I think, was probably a good example. His name's Daryl. He started with us as a junior chef, yeah. and he's now a head of restaurant training. Oh. You know, he's, he's gone up and up and up and up, and he's a hardworking unit. And um, so he said to us one day, I'm not happy with the, um, uh, the actions that we're coming up with daily. Day to day, we're coming up with all these ideas and innovation and actions, and we're not putting these actions into a format that is capable of being tracked mm. and implemented mm. and then if it's a fail being killed, you know, yeah. it will be, yeah. being, you know, fail fast as they say. And so he said, I want, I want to put this system in place, which we use now called Monday.com. Um, and that system has become the foundation of all new innovation, project management, um, all of the onboarding so we can track the employees onboarding with us so that we don't neglect an employee. It's, it's, it's had such a big impact on the business and it comes from Daryl. <laughs> Daryl, if you're watching, all thanks to you. <laughs> Daryl's the man. Thanks, Daryl. <laughs> so, I mean, coming back to your point on saying that F&B businesses are tough. Like, wh why is it so tough? And if you could help people understand, you know, perhaps they are coming into F&B as an entrepreneur. Yeah. What kind of margins are you looking at? And like, why do most businesses fail? Man, I mean, um, it's it's a golden question it really is and i think in fmb it's especially brutal industry um i've answered this question before and i think i think the best answer is most business ha businesses have maybe five major variables that can threaten them five critical variables fmb has like 50 variables you know 
there's so many more variables that you have to sort of control. And I think that's the first component on why F&B, the success rates are not high. And then secondly, <laughs> the second point would be, I think, not everybody thinks, oh, because I can put a Band-Aid on, I can be a surgeon, right? Mm -hmm. Because I can, um, because I can uh, strap an ankle, I can be a, a uh, orthopedic person. But in, the, in our industry, everyone's like, oh, I can cook spaghetti bolognese at home. I could open a restaurant. You'll be fine. You know, let's do it. Everybody has got a Ramsey during COVID. Yeah, now. man, I think so. So um, it's very tempting to get into the industry because we all, we all, everyone's a bit of a foodie in one way or another. Everybody's passionate about food or ingredients. And so it's very tempting to get into the industry. And that has made the industry wildly competitive, wildly competitive. Um, and then I think even more, what, what's compounded that even further is all the landlords around the world, as Amazon and Alibaba, as all these businesses kind of um, uh, dislocated retail, all the landlords started, a lot of the landlords started moving from like an 80% retail, 20% F&B. Yeah to 20% retail, 80% F&B. Yeah. So now you go into a shopping mall that may have had 20% retail, it's now 80% uh, F&B. Yeah. So your competition's ferocious, you know? Um, and that, that basic supply demand, when there's an oversupply of something, what happens? Price comes down. Yeah. So then it's a price war, you know? And then um, that's where it really gets very painful. So the only way, we think, the only way to combat a price war is to have the best product the best food and that's why we never compromise on the food and stuff. Coming back to your journey with GYG, what were the key challenges that you faced? Yeah. You know, the highs are highs, the lows are lows. Yeah. Like how low and what were the key oh. you know, issues you had to grapple with? How long we got, man? We got like <laughs> seven hours. <laughs> I can talk for seven hours on this one. Yeah. Man, no, I think the, the to, to rank the top three challenges, I think, um, which was a severe problem when we launched in 2014, but it has become more severe over time, even further compounded by COVID was manpower challenges. Um, and that is a really serious problem for any business. You know, you if you're a um, doctor's surgery and you can't get the, the um, executive assistants at the front counter, you can't book yep. surgeries in. You know, yep. the manpower shortage is, is a very, very painful problem for us. Um, uh, the second one would be real estate because the competition for real estate here is very strong. Um, it's very hard to convince a landlord that when we're in the beginning, we said, hey, we're GYG, we're Mexican food. And everybody said to us, you guys are crazy. You know, Asia doesn't really eat tacos. You know, what are you talking about? So the landlords are like, oh, we, we need a reliable tenant that's going to be here in 10 years. And we said, that's us. Well, you know, we'll be here in 10 years. And they're like, oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> So real estate was a big challenge and um, that's got easier as we've been scaling. Um, so manpower, real estate. And then I think that the last one is um, when the Singapore government said the best way to combat manpower shortages is automation and technology, we listened. We really listened to that. And so we went on a journey to revolutionize our technology and our automation. That was hard. All right, so I think we are in the Tanjong Plaga outlet. Yeah. And uh, behind is full of activities and it's, you know, 24-7 yep. uh, bustling. So should we just go and check out your operations since we are going to talk about operations anyway? Let's do it. All right, man, yeah, let's man. go. Excellent. So right now we are going to check out the kitchen. But first and foremost, how many meals get churns out in this kitchen every day? About uh, a thousand. So it's like a machine. Yeah, yeah, it's a machine, man. This is a machine. This is the... This team is an outstanding team. Let's check out those machines. Let's do it. So our point of sale system at the front here, this is our engine room. This is the sort of backbone where we engage with all of our customers. And the technology sends the order to our kitchen here. We've got stickers at the back of house there. And the orders are prepared along the Bain Marine here. These are our brilliant chefs here. These guys are dynamite. And this is where all the food is prepared along this part of the kitchen. And I know you use a lot of technology. Like yeah, yeah. you have to be one of the most forward thinking guys. Yeah and coming to running an f and restaurant. Yeah. What are you proud of? Like, what are the, the tech stuff here that you think that is super awesome? Awesome, man. Yeah, I think um, the it's the point of sale is, is definitely the, the backbone of, of, 
of what we do. It really yeah. is. And um, the, the, the infrastructure inside this restaurant, I mean, it doesn't really look very impressive, a couple of pat screens around, yeah. but the, the, way it, the way it works sort of to, to guide the team to allow them to cope with like really big volumes in a very really short period is is outstanding. So man, definitely point of sale. That's yeah. a that's a really powerful um, tool for us. Yeah. I think the second one would be um, where our business gets up to like forty percent delivery sales in, in some of our restaurants. So that's a lot of revenue that's flowing into the business through the the point of sale to, or through the delivery tablets. Yeah. And so getting that. Um, that you order information into the point of sale is very um, important. And we use a system to do that, which which streamlines the order taking process. Otherwise we'd have to have someone standing there taking orders, um, which again, painful, creates errors, all kinds of difficulty if, if there's that bottleneck there. So that's fixed. Um, man, and then I think um, uh, the food safety procedures we have in place are state of the art. I think mm. we're, we're We've really put a lot of effort into ensuring the highest food safety standards are, are maintained every day. Yeah. And then we're constantly auditing our our compliance. So um, we kind of changed the culture from, I think an audit can be seen as a scary thing or like a, you know, I'm gonna get in trouble, I'm gonna get scolded. Yeah. For us, we view an audit as a as a blessing. It's, a, it's, a, it's kind of like a gift. We want to be audited because that's gonna help us remain compliant with our own procedures, with our own food safety policies. And that's how we are able to scale. So we're constantly auditing and we use a system to, to conduct those audits, which flows into the cloud. Anything that's, any, any major problems we have in the restaurant, uh, uh, an alert is triggered to the whole management team to say, we've got a serious problem with this restaurant. Yeah. And that's triggered live. Um, and that's another system that we love. You know, that's, that's been fantastic for us. Awesome stuff. You mentioned about food delivery. Yeah. I know it's a big part of your business. It is. How are you thinking about food delivery, you know, and how are you going to kind of incorporate that as part of your business? QSR, in its own right, it is not possible to survive today with just dine-in or just delivery. I don't think it's possible. There has to, the, the new world is mm. a combination of delivery and dine-in yeah. working together. That's not optional anymore. But any, any, business model, any concept, any creation in F&B QSR must embrace delivery as a as a very serious component of the business. Yeah. Um, and that flows into ops, into price point, into photography, um, uh, into descriptions. Customers want to know exactly what's in the, in the um, menu item. They want to see it. Yeah. Um, if, if they can't, if, they, if, if you put sort of really shitty photos up in these delivery aggregator portals like Uber and Food Panda and Grab and stuff, conversion rate just goes through the floor, yeah. you know. So there's a lot of thought that's got to go into the photography. Yeah. You know, it's a, yeah, that's a, that's a critical part of any QSR. Speaking of marketing, what's the most innovative way to innovate? I see a lot of people going on TikTok yeah. and all that social media stuff. Yeah. Man, it's hard to keep up. <laughs> like, it's hard to keep up with the I screen. can't, I can't keep up. Oh, it's man. young people. You know that I was so proud of myself yesterday. Yeah. I just downloaded Instagram. That's <laughs> These guys the asked me to download Instagram. Fantastic. Yeah. Man. No, I, I've got Instagram. I, I, do, I don't mind Instagram as well, but yeah, man, that's tough. And then but all the algorithms work differently. And then how do you optimize the, the, the marketing, the capital deployment to get the ROI? The analogy we use is it's like turning a Titanic, or turning a, a um, tanker. So you, you turn the wheel on the yeah. tanker and for 20 minutes, you keep going straight. You know? <laughs> it doesn't move. It doesn't move. <laughs> All right, now they're going to check out the magic that's going to happen and how your GYG food appears at your doorstep and your table. Yeah, Josh, you are a talk us too. Nice team. So guys, yeah, we're, we're so proud of the quality of the equipment we use, the ingredients we use. Here's an example. We've got our beautiful Electrolux grill here. We're loyal fans of Electrolux. They do such a great job for us. Our induction stove tops here. Does all our veggies, sauteed veggies, our tofu ranchero. A little bit behind you there is for our fries and our hard shell tacos, our corn chips, which we fry fresh every morning and again in the afternoon. Bounce is getting hot in here. Let's get out. Yeah. So there's a lot of myths when it comes to Mexi Mexican food and GYG. Would you like to debunk some of this myth, Josh? I think Mexican cuisine has been done badly in the past, over the years. That's created a reputation of this Tex-Mex where things are Mexican may not be seen as healthy. Something we are so proud of 
is the ingredients we use. So we use the Australian Roma tomatoes. We air freight these in twice a week. Our Aussie Hass avocados. This is what we use every morning and in the afternoon to make our, our uh, guacamole. The supply chain's not almost perfect. You start to get a bit of deterioration in the avos. We've mastered this supply chain now. And so the Aussie Hass avocados are why our guacamole is so good. And this is the good stuff here, guys. Check this out. No shortcuts. All right, Josh. Thanks for the tour back. Awesome. In the kitchen. I understand that Tanjong Paga outlet, this outlet means a lot to you. Yeah, man. What's that about? Man, so this outlet uh, has a strong history with Hong and I. So we launched 2013, end of 2013, in Asia Square, and then we launched in Chevron House. So we had two outlets. And these two outlets were doing well. But one of our mentors had said to us, in Singapore, because the rents are high, if you have one really bad outlet, it will wipe out five good outlets wow. from an economic standpoint. And so we had the two strong outlets that were performing well in Raffles Place. And this was our first big rent site. You know, this was the first site where it was quite scary. So um, we, we put an enormous amount of effort into the fit out and making the, the restaurant optimized the, for seating capacity and stuff like this. And I remember that first day, man, like we, we roll, we roll the, sh the shutters up. Yeah. And man, I was praying to the F&B gods, like, please <laughs> make this restaurant work. And uh, it opened and it exploded, you know, and it, the, the first two restaurants were doing X revenue. This restaurant did 2X. Wow. So we were so happy with it, you know, and it really, it really performed very well. And it worked, uh, man, I've never been more relieved in my life. <laughs> F&B gods answered, I guess. They, they did, man, they blessed us. But it's also, such thin margins, right? Between success and failure. Man, I think, How much um, is luck, really? I don't think there's a whole lot of luck in there. I mean, if, you, if you're willing to really grind it out and, and work work hard, then, then that's where the magic is, is created. But um, no, you're right. I think, to your point, actually, the margins in the restaurant industry, the difference is there's a lot of fixed costs. So if you have a, if your revenue is weak in a one month, it can, it can, the P&L can shift very quickly. That's probably a very, that's the difference with F&B. So um, uh, I think with revenue, you can fix any problem. And that's when, it, if you can really supercharge the revenue, that's when the margins really improve. But yeah, you, you're right. It, it's, it's a dangerous margin business. <laughs> so looking into the future, are you going to open more outlets? Are you going to serve good food like that? Yeah, man, you know, like it's, it's, when we, when we came here to Singapore, everyone said five restaurants, that's all you'll be able to open. The market's not big enough, you'll only have five. Yeah. So we get to five and then everyone says, ah, oh, 10, 10, 10, 10, you can have 10. So we get to 10 and everyone's like, ah, oh, 20, 20. And now we're almost 20 people like, ah, oh, 50, you can have 50. <laughs> so, so, um, so uh, it's, I mean, that's the funny version, but I think we're, we are so privileged with the way Singapore has received GYG. Yeah. And we're so honored by how warm Singapore has been to our food, right? They, they really, the, the Singapore um, community has, has embraced the brand. And, and I mean, almost all of our staff are Singaporean staff. And it, you know, it's, it's a privilege. It's quite, makes, you know, it's almost emotional how, how fortunate we've been in Singapore. But yes, man, we're definitely opening more outlets because the demand is there. We're getting people in our social media saying like, Open in Yishun, open at Changi. We yeah. want you in Jewel, you know, yeah. to Woodlands and stuff. How do you choose your outlets? Man, so that's a funny story, actually. A another mentor of mine, we, we built, Hong and I, we built this big real estate plan, you know, and we had, it was all complicated and all these sort of, all this detail and stuff. And we presented it to this mentor of ours who, who is, is such a f fantastic human being. And he grabs this, this big plan and just tears it up. He no way, really? And I was like, aren't you going to look at it? You? Yeah. And he goes, no, just get the F and B, get the um, MRT map. Get the MRT map and we'll put pins in it. Just pin, pin, nice. pin, 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 done. <laughs> <That's what you laughs> need yeah, so I was thinking more oh, about these uh, 10 year plans and 5 year plans. No need. No, I don't think MRT so. MRT and yeah, then that's it. Done. Yeah. <laughs> man, I mean, where we're F and B, we're privileged again in Singapore is the density of population here is so high that your ability to capture a lot of people within a close radius to your restaurant is, is, if you've got a great product, man, there's probably what, 
a million people within five kilometers of where we're sitting right now. That's true. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk food. Yeah. What's next? You know, can you walk us through what, what are we having here and also what's yeah. next for GYG? Man, so this is a spicy chicken burrito bowl. This is our most popular dish. Okay. Um, we've got our, our famous guacamole on top, which is a modifier and an add-on. We've got our, our corn chips that were fried fresh this afternoon okay. um, here in the back of the house in the kitchen. Um, yeah, man, I mean, it's, it's as I was saying in the kitchen before, Tex-Mex has this sort of dirty reputation, but we believe why does it have to be dirty in there? And then further to that, fast food has a dirty reputation. It doesn't have to be, just because it fa it's fast doesn't mean it has to be poor quality food. And, that, and I think that's why, that's what we're becoming famous for. It's real ingredients. It's the highest quality avocados. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're so proud of it. So the spicy chicken burrito bowl, our most famous dish, our best seller on delivery and dine-in. And can you help us understand how are you thinking about alternative meats? Is it something that you think about? It's pretty new yeah. in industry, right? Yeah, man. I think and we have what, chicken here? That's our chicken. That's our famous spicy chicken. Yeah. Marinated in our uh, Guerrero marinade over for 24 hours. So I think the alternative meats, um, Everything takes time to evolve and I think the first version of anything is always going to be the, the flagship that begins a movement. I remember I got the, the first iPhone. Mm -hmm. You compare the first iPhone to today, yep. man that thing's like a, it's like comparing a push bike to a Ferrari, you know, mm. something like that. And so I think the, the, the plant-based alternative meats is on that journey of, of evolving. I think people are wondering about the processing that goes into these meats. Are they, are they over-processed? Everyone's worried about processing. Um, and then how many ingredients go into these. Do you, do you use any plant-based in your... We don't at the moment, but we are looking to launch a, a, a meat alternative very soon. You hear it? Here first, guys. Yeah, yeah. It's exciting. <laughs> if I could just also perhaps get you to share a bit more about if people are trying to be an entrepreneur, is it cut out for everyone? Man, you know, I think it is. I, I think if, if, if someone finds the, something that they're genuinely um, fascinated by, they don't have to necessarily love it. <laughs> you know, I think really? find what you like, Steve Jobs thing, find what you love and then you'll never work it out in your life. Yeah. I'm not sure I agree with that. Okay, <laughs> okay, fair enough. But find something that I think that's very fascinating and, and, and very motivating um, and you can't stop thinking about it. I think that's a, that's where anyone can be entrepreneur. Definitely, man, a hundred percent. And you talk about chewing glass. Yeah, yeah, that's the Elon Musk quote. Yeah. Uh, that's true, man. Like uh, running a business is at one point or another, as he says, like chewing glass. It's <laughs> chewing broken glass. I rather chew on chicken. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so if I could now close the session off with a few rapid fire questions. Yeah. So that means oh. I ask you a question and you've got to just answer in one word. One word, okay. Yeah. okay. Singapore. Awesome. <laughs> Love. Love? <sighs> Wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you got it. That was a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Employees? Uh, um, everything. Favorite movie? The Terminator. <laughs> so the school man, it shows no, your age. No, it does a bit. Well, I was watching the Schwarzenegger Netflix. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It goes with my head, yeah. Terminator. All right, Josh, any last words or any shout out to the audience? Yeah, man. Well, first, thanks for having me, man. I, I think this is such a good idea. And I think back to when I was launching my business and I listened to a lot of these podcasts and, and a lot of these sort of inspirational idea generating um, sort of podcasts of people that have gone through the journey. Geez, it helps a lot. So. Thank you for having me, man. And then I think secondly, Singapore, we're hiring. We'd love to have, uh, we'd love to have as many new recruits as possible join us and um, for, across all the different divisions in the, in the restaurants to the head office. Join us, we'd love to have you. Uh, and then finally to all of Singapore, our next restaurant's coming at Holland Village. That should be opening the beginning of September. Uh, and then we're looking at a couple, potentially another one in the Bishan area. Uh, later 2023 um, but to, to Singapore thank you for supporting us and uh, it's a pleasure it's a pleasure you hear it from us first and if you like today's episode please like share and subscribe now I'm going back to my food I'm hungry <laughs>